Bravery is better than safety. Can we all say bravery is better than safety? Simon up the back, he's made an awesome graphic for today. All I did was send him that title and this is what he's come back with. But I think it's exactly on point. We've got a lion. Yeah, round of applause for Simon. <laughs> we've got a lion on the right and we've got the shadows on the left. Bravery is better than safety. The lion can represent bravery, but today that would just be doing the scary thing or dealing with the trouble or staring the monster in the eye. And safety today can be staying in the shadows or remaining in comfort. I'm not saying safety is bad, but if that's our priority, I think we're missing out on what God's going to do. So <laughs> I'm a pretty straightforward guy. Georgia and I are very different. My wife, Georgia, and I are very different like that. When God speaks to Georgia, he takes her on this beautiful, long path of revelation and Bible stories. <laughs> uh, when God talks to me, it's like five words, straight to the point. Um, and this has been on my heart for a month or so now, this idea of bravery being better than safety. And the reason I say I'm a straightforward guy is because that's my whole point today, telling you right up the front at the start, bravery is better than safety. It's better to do the scary thing than to shy back. A lot of these ideas and this quote, bravery is better than safety, I didn't come up with. Um, I'm a big fan of a famous psychologist called Jordan Peterson. Um, he's fallen in a bit of controversy recently, but the majority of his work, and he's written some three really amazing books, I'd highly recommend. He doesn't profess to being a Christian, but he uses Christian stories the Judaic and Christian history um, to tell stories as kind of like our myth for our culture. So why we know what is right and why we know what is wrong. So I'd really recommend you looking him up. But he came up with this idea or this quote of bravery being better than safety. So my point, it's better to look directly, unwaveringly and decidedly at the thing that is terrifying you afflicting you or burdening you. It's better to address it than to avoid it or not acknowledge it. I thought of a few uh, examples. The first one's probably the silliest one. But I um, grew up playing rugby and then I played football afterwards. Those that know rugby or like rugby um, can understand, but I'll try to explain it. So I was put in the forward line. You might know I'm kind of a big guy, so they put me in the forwards. For those that don't know, the forwards are the guys that have the scrum and argue over who gets the ball. Um, and when we were being trained in the forward line, we were not trained to dodge or avoid being tackled. We were trained, when you catch the ball from the kick or from the teammate, you run straight at the opposition. You don't dodge, you don't try and duck. When I'm running in a direction, I'm not changing that direction. <laughs> I'm going straight in that direction. But then when I switched to football, it's very different. You want to catch the ball and you want to duck and weave and avoid being tackled and avoid the opposition getting possession. So that's kind of the, the difference here, where rugby could be bravery, going straight at the opposition, dealing with the problem, not dodging. Another example, a bit more serious, is called exposure therapy. This is a type of therapy that um, psychologists or therapists use for people with, typically with phobias, so like an intense fear about something. A good example would be someone that has a phobia of snakes. They might get shown a photo of a snake, or they might be near someone with a snake, or they might even hold a snake. Or someone that is afraid of small spaces might even get in an elevator. The idea is that the person is exposed to the thing that they're afraid of. But the really amazing part that I wanted to highlight is exposure therapy doesn't work if the person is forced to do it. Exposure therapy only works if the person voluntarily looks at the snake, gets in the elevator, does the thing that scares them. So again, bravery is better than safety. Speaking of snakes, it's kind of a strange image. You might actually recognize the snake on the staff. It's the international symbol for 
medicine or the hospitals. Anyway, it comes from this. So we'll go into it briefly. But it's a story from Numbers 21. So Numbers 21, the second or third book, Georgia, in the Bible? Third? <laughs> third book in the Bible? Fourth book in the Bible? <laughs> um, so the Israelites have come out of exile. They've done the Exodus, so the book of Exodus. They were in slavery in, in Egypt under Pharaoh. God's pulled them out, and they're wandering around the desert trying to find the promised land. And it really brings home the point of bravery being better than safety because of God's response to what happens. So we've got our Bible passage, Numbers 21, 4 to 9. I'll read it out. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water and we loathe this worthless place. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. So that's the story. I'll give you my summary of it. The Israelites have been pulled out of Egypt. They've been delivered out of slavery. They're looking for the promised land. Aaron, which is Moses' brother, has just died in the previous passage because he disobeyed God. Israel has just defeated the Canaanites after being attacked by them. So they've had some loss and they've had some victory. The Israelites become impatient. They speak against God and against Moses. They complain about a lack of food and a lack of water, even though their food is manna from heaven. And in the previous chapter, Moses literally makes water come out of a rock. And they're complaining that they can't find the promised land. So... God sends fiery serpents amongst them. We can't deny this happened. I don't really have a theology for why God would inflict suffering on his people. And I think that's a really big topic that really deserves to be unpacked. But for our purposes today, we can just say God sent fiery serpents. Some people got bitten, or no, many people got bitten, and some Israelites died. The Israelites come to Moses. They acknowledge that they've sinned against Moses and against God, and they ask Moses to ask God to take the snakes away. That's the backdrop. Moses prays. He gets told to to make a bronze serpent statue so that if someone is bitten, they can look at the statue and they will be healed. So the process is if you get bitten, you need to look at the statue and you'll be healed. God doesn't take away the snakes. God tells the Israelites to look at their affliction, to look at the thing that is afflicting them, and that will heal them. This is kind of strange. Wouldn't you take away the snakes? They've they've repented, they've changed their ways. But instead, God says, if you were bitten by a deadly snake with venom running through your body and a snake bite leaking blood, out of your body, you need to go and look at a bronze snake and that's what will stop you from dying. I think God is saying bravery is better than safety. You need to look at the thing that is afflicting you or causing suffering or causing pain or anguish and when we look at it, that's when he'll heal us or that's when he brings about resolution. So what's the snake for us here in 2022? I've never been bitten by a snake. I have been stung by a scorpion, but that's a different story. (laughs) What am I saying we should acknowledge? In short, we need to look at sin or affliction or pain or suffering and even evil. This could be for you. It could be for your loved ones. It could even be for our community or our nation. 
I don't need to tell you that there is evil in this world. Sin is rampant. It's damaging literally everything beyond our understanding. And this is part of why this message is so meaningful to me and why I wanted to share about it today. I've been really struck by how our God is the God who acknowledges the pain and sin in the world. He doesn't shy away from it. The worst of life that I've seen or heard of, any death or abuse or pain or heartache, none of it's been beyond God interacting with it or connecting with me or that person in that pain. And that leads me to a key part of the Christian faith that I think we should acknowledge, not so much celebrate, but definitely acknowledge, and that's that we as Christians acknowledge sin. We acknowledge evil. We acknowledge suffering. I've got a summary just off the top of my head of key people from the Bible. And this isn't the things that they did well. This is the things that they sinned or fell short in. Starting at the very beginning with Adam and Eve disobeying God, they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. David, very famous for lusting after Bathsheba and engaging in that sin. Solomon, the pinnacle of greed and hedonism. Noah, he ended his days in in drunkenness. Moses killed a man. Abraham literally said that his wife was his sister so they wouldn't get killed. And the very famous story of Peter denying Jesus three times whilst he watched Jesus get tortured. And Paul, before he became a Christian, instigated the systematic killing of Christians. These downfalls or sin or shortcomings aren't hidden. It's, it's really easy to find in the Bible or a quick Google search. And we as Christians, we aren't hiding away from that. We need to acknowledge that this happened and it hasn't stopped happening, that people continue to sin and fall short. But that's part of the power of God and, and Christianity that we can acknowledge sin and pain and hurt and suffering. So my point for including this is not to celebrate evil or to air dirty laundry, but to say I think God intentionally included these things in the Bible. For us as Christians to look at it and acknowledge those that we revere most and that they fell short. That we need to look at the bronze snake and get healed. We need to look at the thing that's hurting or causing pain and get healed. Another example in the New Testament, one of my favorite interactions of Jesus is from John chapter 4, 13 to 26. It's a bit longer, but I've cut it short. So the lead up to this is Jesus is sitting at a well. Georgia, when she was going through Bible college, they taught her every time there's a well, pay attention because God's about to do something. So Jesus is sitting at a well, and it says prior to this that it was midday or the middle of the day. It was super hot. We're in the Middle East. It's a desert. Jesus is thirsty. He goes and sits at a well when it's super hot, and we know now that he was waiting for this specific person to come. A Samaritan woman comes to the well. Bit of background for you. There was a lot of prejudice between the Jewish people and the Samaritan people. So we can surmise, I'm an English teacher, we can surmise that Jesus intentionally waited for this person because he knew that she would come when other people wouldn't come to the well, that it's hot, it's the worst time to go and carry like 50 kilos of water. All right, we'll pick it up in verse 13. Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband. You have had five husbands and I'm even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshipped? 
Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him. For salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father in looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus said, I am the Messiah. So the Samaritan woman doesn't really want to interact with people. That's why she's going during the hottest part of the day. She knows that she's had five husbands and the man she's living with now is not her husband, which is a very, very shameful thing in that time period. Jesus asked her for a drink. He ignored the prejudice between the Jews and Samaritans and between men and women of the time. He asked the outcast for a drink. She then offers him a drink. And Jesus then says, or Jesus then tells her about the everlasting water. And then she asks him for the everlasting water. Then Jesus asked her to go get her husband. He called her out for living with a man that she wasn't married to. Now, this again is strange. Jesus didn't beat around the bush. He didn't even talk her through getting the everlasting water. He spoke straight to the sin in her life. She responded by acknowledging Jesus' divinity. She said, you must be a prophet by knowing that I've had five husbands and I'm not living with a man, I'm not married to the man I live with. And she's asked about accessing God through her own understanding of how to access God. So she's said, why are we Samaritans not able to connect with God the same way that you Jews do? And Jesus responds. He says, true worshippers will worship in spirit and in truth. And then he tells her that he is the Messiah. In short, Jesus pointed out her sin in a pretty non-pastoral way. That he tells her about the everlasting life or everlasting water. And she says, can I have the everlasting water? And then he says, you're not married to the man you're living with. It's probably not how pastors operate. Hey, Frank and Beck. (laughs) But she responded. She acknowledged her sin and Jesus told her how she could connect with God from then on. And Jesus sometimes speaks in parables, but there are times when he speaks straight to the issue. And this is again my point about Bravery being better than safety. God wants to, or he will address it straight to the point. Sometimes he does take us on a long revelatory journey, but other times he speaks straight to the sin or the pain in our lives. And God always responds. An example that I wanted to share and embarrass Tori and Adrian about Uh, George and I are running the youth group at the moment with the amazing help of Tori and Adrian. And I was really inspired when we had a meeting last term, towards the end of last term. Tori and Adrian both shared about how scary running youth was, but then they both said, but we're still going to do it. And I thought that was super brave. I think it doesn't matter what your fears or hesitations are, If you've got these fears and hesitations and then you still do the thing, that's brave and God honours that. I can think back to the worst things that I've ever seen or the worst things that I've ever done and God has a response. I wanted to share a story from 2019, I think the most traumatic experience I've ever had. Um, I was working as a house manager for a housing provider for people at risk of homelessness in Melbourne. And uh, part of the job was living there on site. So we lived with these guys. There was about 30 of them um, with a whole variety of different issues going on that led them into homelessness and then led them out of homelessness with us. So my colleague and I were really worried about a specific resident because we hadn't seen him in maybe three days. And so we decided to go and check on his room. 
When we checked on his room, we knocked on the door and there was no response. So we had to open the door with the key and go in. And we found that he'd overdosed and died on the bed. It was terrifying. It was one of the worst things I've ever seen. I was 25, the guy who died was 26, and he'd grown up in a similar area to me. So on top of being exposed to this horrific incident, I was also faced with why was I not in this circumstance, but he was. And I don't share this story to celebrate it, but to say that whatever we throw at God, he will respond. For me, dealing with that afterwards, God really shone through providing me with hope for future people that we had in that house. And also as a response to people that are dealing with drugs or trauma or or pain or whatever's leading them to that thing. God wants us to be brave and to address what is scary. But God is also brave and he is not safe, more so than we could ever be. He has a response to the pain, sin, affliction or suffering that we see in our lives or those around us. And so for me, it involved getting therapy and reconciling that God cares so much for the downtrodden and the hurt. And if someone turns to drugs to feel something, I certainly will not condemn that person. But I want that person to be brave in their own way and deal with that issue so that they can heal. Here it is. God wants us to be brave and not safe. He wants us to look at the pain or the abuse, the shame, the hurt, the sickness, the sin, loneliness, exhaustion. He wants us to look at it, to not be safe, but to be brave and to invite him into it. He has a response. He will respond to our bravery and he'll meet us in the problem. He will not leave you there. He'll look directly at it with you and provide the healing or the way out or both. So that leads me to communion. As Frank said, we would do it. Please grab your cups and I'll invite our awesome worship band up. If you don't have one, let us know and our ushers will give you a, some bread and wine or juice. Communion is, one of the, communion is one of the most powerful things that you can do as a Christian. We do it each Sunday as Christians to remember the literally unfathomable sacrifice that Jesus made for us. When we're doing communion, we're eating the bread representing his body and we're drinking the juice representing his blood. We're looking at the sin in our lives or the lives around us. We're looking at the pain or sickness in those around us and we're inviting God in by remembering his body was broken, his blood was shed. So while we do communion, I'm not going to lead you through it but our band are going to play a bit of worship and give you time to pray for yourself or pray for those around you. But here's my challenge. Be specific. God wants to deal with specific things in your life. We're not looking for an airy fairy, forgive me for all of my mistakes. Be specific. I lied on this day, please forgive me. My sister needs healing, please heal her. Be specific. Ask God in and then you'll see him move. So let me pray for you and then our team will lead us through while we do worship at your own pace. God, I thank you that you are brave. I thank you that we can be brave. We thank you for your sacrifice on the cross, how you took all the sin, all the pain, all the hurt, all the sickness, and you dealt with it. I pray you'd lead us all through this in our own I pray you'd meet all of us here. Amen. Spirit, drop us away.
Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for speaking to us today. Father, I pray for those of us that are, have things that are weighing us down or things that are holding us back. Lord, I thank you that we can look to you as the bronze serpent and that you bring healing into our lives. In Jesus' name. And just before we close the service, I, I don't know everybody here, but I want to give an opportunity for those of you that perhaps have not yet made Jesus your Lord and Savior. This is the moment for us to connect back with God. And I want to read a scripture to you from John chapter 3. Many of us know John 3.16, probably recited all off the top of our head. But I want to read 13 to 15. And it says, No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. So we know that's talking about Jesus. It says, And, verse 14, As Moses lifted up the bronze snake on the pole in the wilderness, as Matt had spoken about, it says, So the Son of Man must be lifted up. So we know that the bronze serpent being lifted up, that people didn't look at the snakes, uh, and they looked at the bronze serpent, and those that got bitten by the snakes were healed. That was a type of Jesus to come. So that today, as we look at Jesus who was lifted up like that bronze snake, yeah, we have snakes in our lives. Yeah, we've still got things that have been bitten by. Yeah, we have sin, and we have all this stuff, and God doesn't remove all of that from our lives, but he gives the solution the bronze serpent that was lifted up, Jesus that was lifted up. It says, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. So maybe you're here this morning and you're like, I've never made a commitment to follow Jesus. I've never made a decision to allow him in my heart. I've never really just acknowledged him as Lord and Saviour. I don't want that service to finish without giving you that opportunity to make that decision today. Because in the beginning, we were created to be with God. But through sin, through decisions that were made, through disobedience, man was separated from God. But then Jesus came and he died on the cross. He became the bronze serpent that was lifted up. And as we look to him, as we believe in him, as we acknowledge him as Lord and Savior, then we can be restored back to God. And as it said in verse 15, we can have eternal life. So if you're here this morning and you've never made that decision or that commitment to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, maybe you did one time, but you kind of let it drift away and kind of went off track. Now's the moment for you to get back into that intimate relationship with God. So if that's you, I'm going to ask you to lift up your hand as an acknowledgement of who he is and an acknowledgement that he is the bronze serpent that's been lifted up. So if that's you this morning and you're wanting to make that commitment to God, lift up your hand right now as an acknowledgement to him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. And I just want us to pray this prayer because... We can pray this together. Let's do it together in unity on the count of three. One, two, three. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I have sinned and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sin and I choose to trust you as my Saviour and Lord. I invite you into my heart and ask you to guide my life. Thank you for restoring my relationship back with you in Jesus' name. And everyone says, Amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer for the first time or recommitting back to God, then please come and see myself, Rebecca, M Matt, or one of our leaders, somebody, so that we could help you on your journey and put something in your hand, to a Bible or something to help you grow spiritually. Is that cool? God is good. Amen.